Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 55 years of ministry. This week, Andrew continues to bring you a portion of the 2023 Orlando Gospel Truth Conference. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you that God wants you to rise up and just decide that, praise God, I am going to find God's purpose for my life and I am going to go for it. And now, here's Andrew. There was a partner of mine in Charlotte, North Carolina, that every time I went to his place, he would have me come speak to his people. He would tell them that the clock is running. He's going to pay them for the time that they're spending. And he told me to just talk as long as I want to. And I would minister to him and then I'd pray with him. And anyway, I came out one time after doing that and there was an Oriental lady that was sitting at the uh, reception desk and she wasn't back there with the other employees. And so when I came out, I asked who she was and she told me and I said, how come you weren't back with the rest? And she says, I'm the new employee and they left me here to answer the phones. And then she said, who are you? And I told her my name and she says, what do you do? And I told her I'm a minister and boy, her eyes got big and she said, for who? (laughs) And I said, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this woman just exploded and she said, you're the one. You're the one. And I said, I'm the one what? (laughs) And she told me that the night before she was a Buddhist and she was going through her rituals and she just, in the middle of it, she said, there's got to be something more than this. See, a holy dissatisfaction. She knew that there was a God, but she wasn't content with just going through these rituals. And she just stopped in the middle and she says, God, I know you're real, but who are you? And she said that this ball came in front of her of light and it was pulsing light. And she heard an audible voice saying, Tomorrow I'm going to send you a man who will tell you who I am. And she says, You're the one. And I said, I am the one. Amen. And I got to lead this woman to the Lord. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I went out and sat in my car. And I bet you it was five minutes before I could start my car. And I was just thinking, God, I was in the exact place that I was supposed to be. What an honor to know. And there was a satisfaction that comes with knowing that you are exactly where God wants you to be, that you can't get praying for it and begging for it and asking God to give you joy and peace. There's some of you, the reason that you don't have any joy and peace is because you aren't doing what God told you to do or you're limiting Him Like I was talking about, I was doing what God told me to do, but I was limiting him by my small thinking, thinking, God, how could you use somebody like me? And you've got to change. How long are you going to sit there till you die? And don't be afraid of dying. We're all going to die. Do you know a friend of mine, Dave Hinton, he ministers with me a lot and he's had circulation problems. He's a six foot seven giant. And uh, anyway, he, they wanted to cut his leg off. They even put a, a marker around his leg, dotted line, where they were going to cut on his leg. And he told the doctor, I will not be defeated. <laughs> and he just refused to do it. And this doctor was telling him, you've got to do this and you got to do this. And anyway, he just, he wasn't responding. And the doctor says, you aren't taking this serious. You are going to die. And Dave just looks right at him and says, so are you. (laughs) And the doctor just, he he said, what do you mean? He says, we're all going to die. I'm ready to die. Are you ready to die? And he just went to witnessing to the guy. Amen. But you know what? Unless Jesus comes in our lifetime, we're all going to die. Why are we so afraid of death? We sing a song about when we all get to heaven, what a day that's going to be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you start crying. (laughs) What's wrong with us? It says over in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus came to deliver those who who through all their life were subject to vanity through fear of death. Man, you need to get over a fear of death and not just physical death, but a fear of failure. The biggest failure of all is to do nothing, to play it safe. I can promise you when you get to the end of your life, I read a book one time about millionaires and they interviewed them as they were dying And the number one thing that these people who were very wealthy said was they played it too safe. 
Every one of them said, I wished I'd have taken more risks. They knew that they could have done more, but because of fear, they just refused to do it. When you get to the end of your life, nobody's going to be saying, man, I did too much. I believed too hard. I trusted God too much. Nobody's going to say that, but there's a lot of people that are going to be saying, man, I wished I'd have gone for it. Praise God you're here tonight. You don't have to exit this way. You can change right now. You can begin to believe God for something. So they looked at the options. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're for sure going to die. So what's our option? Go out to the Syrians. The worst they could do is kill us. They were going to die anyway. What's the worst thing that could happen to you if you started believing God? The worst thing that could happen is that you fail somehow or another, get embarrassed. But you know what? I I think God looks at things differently than we do. God looks at us like his children and it's like a little kid trying to learn how to ride a bike. And when you start riding, if you fall off the bike, you as a parent don't say, you stupid kid, if you'd have done it the way I told you to do, you wouldn't have fallen. (laughs) That's not the way a parent is. You go up and you say, look, you went five feet. You did good. Try it again. It's always encouraging. God doesn't mind you failing. Every one of us fail. I don't do everything right. Man, you could fill volumes of books with all the mistakes that I've made. And yet God just encourages me and keeps me going. You don't need to be afraid. I think that God looks at us and some of us maybe in the world standards might have failed. But you know what? God's saying, that's my kid. They believed me. They tried. And I believe he is pleased with people who will at least get up and try. So they decided to go out and just reveal themselves to the Syrians because the worst thing that could happen was that they would die. And so in verse five, it says, and they rose up in the twilight You know, that's significant too. In other words, this wasn't early in the morning. This was getting towards the end of the day. Some of you may be getting towards the end of your life. You may think, well, I'm too old. I wished I'd have heard this when I was young. Even if it's your twilight years, you ought to get up and go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. God made them hear this noise. We don't know what it was, but it could have been that they were hearing the angels of God and the host of God. But they thought that the uh, Samaritans had hired a mercenary uh, army to come against them and they just fled. They left their tents, they left their food, they left money, they left clothes, they left food cooking on the thing. So these guys who were starving to death took a chance, went out, and all of a sudden they had more abundance than they had ever had in their life. They went from nearly starving to super abundance. They ate until they couldn't eat anymore. They went and got gold and silver and raiments and hid it until they couldn't even take anymore. And finally they said, you know what? We're wrong. We're just consuming this on ourselves. We ought to go back and tell the people in Samaria. And they went back and told them. They went and checked it out. And these lepers who had been rejected by the people in Samaria went from being zeros to heroes instantly because they said, how long are we going to sit here until we die? Brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you that God wants you to rise up and just decide that, praise God, I am going to find God's purpose for my life and I am going to go for it. And if I shoot at the stars and miss and hit the moon, that's more than what most people would do. I'm going to go for it. But you got to rise up. You got to get out of this wilderness mentality. And I tell you, this world is is like gravity. It's just pulling everybody down, telling you that you can't, telling us that things won't work. Did you know we started the largest expansion in the history of our ministry during the quote unquote Great Recession, 2008 and 2009? And I mean, when everybody was cutting back, 
There's probably 200 plus ministries that are in the Colorado Springs area and I know most of them and I only knew two people, two ministers who kept believing God. The rest actually started decreasing their budgets 15 to 25% anticipating problems because the stock market went down. And that's when the Lord told me to start building. And in nine years, we built $130 million worth of stuff debt-free above my normal expenses. At a time when everybody else was pulling back, we started expanding. See, the world is just constantly telling you you can't. They're predicting failure. God said He would supply your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's not limited to the U.S. economy. It doesn't matter what's going on in this economy. God will bless you. I don't care what's happening. Did you know during that recession, Jamie had inherited a little bit of money from her father's death? It wasn't a lot of money, but we invested it in the uh, stock market. Again, it was, it was a small amount, but... Uh, Long story short, during the time that the stocks went down 50%, we made 50% increase. I still don't know how that happened. <laughs> but it worked. It's according to your faith, not according to this economy. It's according to your faith. God said He chose the weak things of the world to confound the wise, the things that are nothing, things that are base, things that are despised, to bring to naught things that are. And the reason He said He did that, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, I believe, is so that no flesh would glory in His presence. God did it so that He would get the credit. You know, I'm a hick from Texas. If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me but he did. I'm glad that he did. And I've responded. And you know what? God is doing miracles through me and through my life. And he gets the credit for it because my mother, right before she died in 99, she asked me to tell her about what was happening. And I was telling her about all of our offices worldwide and the people that were being changed. And she was one of our biggest partners. She was blessed. But then she looked at me and she goes, Andy, you know, that's God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know it's God. And then only as your mother could do. She says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> she can put you in your place. And I, I agree a hundred percent. I guarantee you, this is not my great ability that's doing it, but it is my availability. God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. He's not looking for a silver vessel. He's looking for a surrendered vessel. And I'm telling you, if you are willing to just open up and rise up and say, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I am not going to sit here until I die. I'm going to do something. I'm going to find out what your purpose, your will for my life is, and I'm going to do it. If you're willing to do that, I guarantee you to transform you. That's point number one. Rise up. The second thing is take your journey and this really goes along with the same thing, that God has called every one of you to something unique to you. Matter of fact, I won't take time, but if you go to, sec to the second chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, 9, and 19, there were three groups of people that he told Moses this same day. He says, don't you dare go into the Edomites, into the Amorites, and anotherite. I forgot which one that was. And he says, you do not have permission to go. I won't give you a shoe breadth of their land. Did you know if he would have applied these seven things that he told him right here and have tried to use it against the Edomites or the Amorites or the other ite, it wouldn't have worked because that wasn't their journey. That wasn't what he told them to do. He told them specifically to go against Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. There were certain things that He ordained them to do, and you can't do what somebody else is doing. You've got to find out what God called you to do. You know, if Satan can't keep you from following God, you know what he'll do? He'll try and give you multiple visions and dilute you. If you have two visions, that's die vision. That's division, and it'll destroy you. If you want to destroy a person's vision, give him two. You need to find out what God called you to do. And you know, 
I have people ask me to do all kinds of things all of the time, but I know what God called me to do and I have to stay on track with what God called me to do. I've got to be stirred up, but I can't just go out and do anything. Not everything that's good is God. Satan will get you sidetracked doing all kinds of things that may be good, but it's not God. You've got to have a specific understanding of what God called you to do. Do you know, this is what changed my life back in 1968. I was seeking God's will for my life. And since I was a little tiny kid, I've known that God had a purpose for my life. When I was five or six years old, I used to lay out in the yard at night and just look up at the stars and wonder, God, what are you going to do with my life? I don't know if everybody was like that, but I used to do that. My mother actually got on my case one time. What are you doing out there in the backyard? Because I did it so much. And when my dad died at 12 years old, I remember at his funeral, they had an open casket and I was just about five or six feet away from his body and they were singing, How Great Thou Art. That was his favorite song. And it seemed so contrary to me that here he was dead and I had prayed for him and even fasted as an 11-year-old kid for my dad to be healed. And yet he wasn't healed, he died. And here we were singing about how great God was and it just seemed, it seemed wrong. It didn't seem like God was great and it didn't seem like he was answering my prayers. And I remember praying and saying, God, if you're great, reveal yourself to me. What do you want me to do? And I kind of let it slip because my life was planned until I graduated from high school. But when uh, I was in my senior year of high school, they started having career days and people came in and started talking about what do you want to do with your life? And so that stirred it up. And my senior year in high school, I went and I mean, I read through the Bible two or three times. I bought five volumes that were that thick of Matthew Henry's commentary. And I read the whole thing, which I wouldn't even recommend now. But that just shows you, I was seeking. I knew that somewhere in here, there had to be an answer to how do you know what God wants you to do? And in at Christmas of 1967, I was at a youth uh, retreat in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and we would ski and tube during the day. And then at night, we'd have a devotion. And a guy just read... Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is for everybody. This isn't just for preachers. This is for everybody. It's our reasonable service. And then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? And when he read that and I heard that this will prove, and he said the word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses. I knew that God had a purpose for me. I just, it just wasn't manifest to me. I didn't know what it was. And this says you will prove, make manifest to the physical senses. What is the good, the acceptable and the perfect will of God? And when I saw that, I said, that's it right there. This is my key. And I spent from Christmas of 1967 till March the 23rd of 1968 doing nothing but praying Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and saying, God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? How do I become a living sacrifice? What does it mean to renew my mind? What does all this mean? And I just prayed. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, God showed up in a prayer meeting. And I tell you what, it transformed my life. And God revealed himself to me and showed me what he wanted me to do. Sometimes I start with that testimony about when the Lord changed my life. But I had been for a, a year and a half been studying the word. And for four months, I had been meditating Romans 12, 1 and 2. And there's a reason God revealed himself. It's because I saw it. You know, we often quote Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope in a future. And we often quote that verse, but then we forget the next two verses. In verse 12, it says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, 
and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. People say, God, what's your will for my life? I've got three minutes before my favorite show comes on. Would you reveal yourself to me? That's not seeking God with your whole heart. As long as you can live without knowing God's purpose for your life, you will. He won't force himself upon you, but he has already written in his book what your life is supposed to be. Your talents, whether you're a male or female, you can't change that, by the way, for those of you that don't know that. Whether you were born male or female, whether what color your skin is, your talents, your abilities, everything about you was created by God to fulfill a purpose. And you've only got one chance of finding what that purpose is. It's not up to you to pick and choose and do whatever you want to do and then ask God to bless it. You need to take your journey, the journey that God prepared for you, not for somebody else. You can't live another person's dream. You can't be like anybody else. You're better at being you than you are anybody else. You need to get comfortable in your skin in what God called you to do. You know, I was just with Rick Renner. I don't know how many of you know Rick Renner, but he's a great blessing. He was speaking at our college. And Rick, we were talking about making television programs. And Rick says, man, I can only make four programs maximum in one day. I make 10 normally. And sometimes I've made as many as 21 programs in one day. And he just, I can't even understand, but it's just normal for me. But then he was talking about that he writes books all of the time. He just writes and it just flows out of him. And I said, man, it's like pulling teeth for me to write. You know what? He's anointed for books. I'm anointed for television. Now he's doing television and uh, that's fine. I write books and that's fine, but that's not my anointing is a media ministry. I'm anointed to do certain things. There are certain things that have a supernatural flow to it. You are anointed for something supernatural. You might be able to do multiple things. I actually had a student stand up this week in my class and he said, I'm one of those that I can do anything. Anything I touch turns to gold. And I told him, I said, I'm, I pity you. <laughs> and some people think, well, man, that's wonderful. No, it's really not. Because that means that it's easy for you to lean under your own understanding. When you don't have any great talents or abilities, it's like, God, what do you want me to do? And when he anoints you, you go with it because you can't do anything else. In a way, it's really a blessing to be a zero talent guy. Amen. <laughs> but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God created you for something and you're going to have to seek with all of your heart. And if you do, you will find. So growing up, I've, I've been around believers. And one thing that I saw that lacked is being able to operate in the, the works of the Spirit, being able to see signs and wonders and things that are found in the book of Acts. But coming to Karis, man, to see people who are not only uh, in love with Jesus, but in love with His Word and are able to operate in those areas in, in uh, both truth, uh, grace, and power, I think was uh, something that definitely changed my life. Uh, I, I don't think I'm any ways uh, perfect in, in maturity or anything like that, but I'm definitely equipped to take the next steps. I went on a missions trip out to Oklahoma, and man, it was actually because of that that I'm doing what I'm doing right now, helping out with my church down in the Springs, and uh, yeah, seeing the fruit that I see in my life. So I'm thankful for that experience and excited to go on the next step with my good friend, my savior, uh, Jesus. And to know him now that much more has changed my life. All right, so in the name of Jesus, here we go. One, two, three. We have officially broke ground. Praise God. Thanks to the support of our friends and partners, Andrew has continued the expansion of our Karis Bible College campus so that we can raise up more disciples to take the gospel further and deeper than ever before. 
because you play such an important role in raising up this next generation, Andrew has decided to give monthly construction updates so that you can see the progress of what your giving and prayers have produced. Visit awmi.net slash Karis Campus to see our most recent update today. On today's program, you saw a portion of Andrew's teaching, Seven Steps to Victory, from the 2023 Orlando Gospel Truth Conference. Learn how to stand against the enemy when you get Andrew's teaching, Seven Steps to Victory. Andrew is offering this booklet as his free gift to you today. This offer is limited to one free booklet per household and is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete teaching, Seven Steps to Victory, is also available as a CD or DVD album and as a USB recorded live at a ministry event. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of September, Andrew will be in Woodland Park hosting the Truth and Liberty Coalition Conference with guest speakers Congressman Doug Lamborn, Richard Harris, David Barton, Chad Connolly, Alex McFarland, Janet Porter, Lucas Miles, and Muhammad Faridi. Be sure to stick around for a special patriotic performance, the 9-11 Memorial Tribute. Then Andrew will be speaking in Hayes, Kansas. Lastly, in September, Andrew will be back in Woodland Park hosting the Vision Conference with guest speaker Dwayne Sheriff. Also, to watch one of Andrew's upcoming live stream events, go to awmi.net slash live. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. Did you know Andrew Womack Ministries is on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Pinterest? We pray that we can bless you with the Word of God wherever you are in the world on any of these platforms. Follow Andrew on social media today. I'm pleased to announce that we now have my television program translated into Spanish. We have a lot of my materials available in Spanish, but let your friends know that we're now broadcasting our daily program in Spanish.